So, hello and welcome everybody to another reading of Babylon Mystery Religion, Chapter 16, An Unmarried Priesthood, from Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth. Only five chapters remaining until we come to the conclusion of this book, and then I will make a conclusion video, as I said already in Chapter 15 and announced that. But now we are caring about an unmarried priesthood and we will see if this is a biblical teaching or is that traditional, is that Gnostic, is that Babylonian teaching of men. Well, when you know the answer you can save yourself the trouble to going through this video. <laughs> Would be interesting maybe anyway. And if you don't, well, I invite you to have a listen, a close listen to the book reading of Babylon Mystery Religion. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. This is a quote from 1 Timothy 1 through 3. And this is how the chapter starts. And in this passage, Paul warned that a departure from the true faith would occur in the later or latter times. Quote, this does not necessarily imply the last ages of the world, writes Adam Clark in his noted commentary, but any times consequent to those in which the church then lived. Unquote. Actually, this departure from the faith, as those who know history understand, took place back in the early centuries. It took only three centuries and all the original church became apostate and infiltrated by wolves in sheep's clothing. The first Christians recognized the worship of pagan gods, sun-worshipping gods, as the worship of devils, as we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 through 21. Quote, what say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils." Unquote. You cannot serve two masters, the same spirit. It follows then that Paul's warning about doctrines of devils could certainly refer to the teachings of S.U.N. sun-worshipping mysteries in Mystery Babylon. He made special mention of the doctrine of forbidding to marry. In the mystery religion this doctrine did not apply to all people. It was, instead, a doctrine of priestly celibacy. Such unmarried priests, Hislop points out in his work, The Two Babylons, were members of the higher orders of the priesthood of the Queen Semiramis, the Queen of Heaven. Hmm? Strange as it may seem, yet the voice of antiquity assigns to the abandoned Queen the invention of clerical celibacy and that in its most stringent form, is a quote from Hislop. Now, celibacy. Look it up in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary and we read, Celibacy, noun, an unmarried state, a single life. It is most frequently, if not always, applied to males or to a voluntary single life. Biblically, this should also mean to abstain from sexual relations, as the Bible teaches that any sexual relations outside biblical marriage is adultery and fornication. This point does not matter with the satanic 
Babylonian priesthood as the pedophile <coughs> and sodomistic worldwide scandals attest to. Well, this letter was of course commentary from Jogler 66 and not from Webster's Dictionary. Webster's Dictionary is an unmarried state, single life, most frequently and not always applied to males or to his voluntary single life. But biblically it means that you should also abstain from sexual relations because every sexual relation outside of marriage is adultery. I already made that point a little bit in chapter 15, the foregoing chapter, so I'm not going into that. Maybe I'm going to do a video on that subject all alone by itself sometime. Anyway, the author continues, Not all nations to which the mystery religion spread required priestly celibacy, as in Egypt where priests were allowed to marry. But, quote, Every scholar knows that when the worship of Sibylle, the Babylonian goddess, was introduced into pagan Rome, it was introduced in its primitive form with its celibate clergy, unquote. Instead of the doctrine of, quote, forbidding to marry, unquote, promoting purity, however, the excesses committed by the celibate priests of S.U.N. sun-worshipping pagan Rome were so bad that the Senate felt they should be expelled from the Roman Republic. Later, after priestly celibacy became established in papal Rome, similar problems developed. Quote, when Pope or Antichrist Paul V sought the suppression of the licensed brothels in the so-called Holy City, the Roman Senate petitioned against his carrying his design into effect, on the ground that the existence of such places was the only means of hindering the priests from seducing their wives and daughters." Unquote. Rome in those days was a quote-unquote holy city, in name only. Reports estimate that there were about 6,000 prostitutes in this city, with a population not exceeding 100,000. Historians tell us that quote, all the ecclesiast ecclesiastics had mistresses, and all the convents of the capital were houses of bad fame. Unquote. A fish pond at Rome, which was situated near a convent, was drained by order of Antichrist Gregory. At the bottom were found over 6,000 infant skulls. Well, if you do a Google research on this uh, skulls, I will uh, give you the link uh, of the Google research that I did and that gives you a lot of results but not of pictures with skulls in a uh, in a pond I can tell you <laughs> because I was looking for that but anyway you can always look that up and I advise you to do that not to take my word for granted or the author's words for granted but to do your own research as I always say now Cardinal Peter Daly said he dared not describe the immorality of the nunneries and that Taking the veil was simply another mode of becoming a public prostitute. Violations were so bad in the 9th century that St. Theodore Studida forbade even females, uh, female animals on monastery property. In the year 1477, night dances and orgies were held in the Catholic cloister at Kirchheim that are described in history as being worse than those to be seen in the public houses of prostitution. Priests came to be known as the husbands of all the women. Albert the Magnificent, Archbishop of Hamburg, exhorted his priests, quote, Si non caste, tamen causte, meaning, if you can't be chaste, at least be careful. Another German bishop began to charge the priests in his district a tax for each female they kept and each child that was born. He discovered there were 11,000 women kept by the clergymen of his diocese alone. So this bishop began to charge the priests 
for each female they kept and each child that was born. That explains a lot of the hidden cemeteries, especially where there are nuns and monasteries and where you can find buried children. When you have to pay taxes for them, when you have to be charged for them, then you just kill the babies and get rid of them. That's what the Roman Catholic Church always, from the beginning, was good in and still is today. Do not think that this is a history book. This don't, things, these things don't happen today. They surely do. And God will reveal all their iniquities when he comes back. The Catholic Encyclopedia says the tendency of some to rake these scandals together and exaggerate details, quote, is at least as marked as the tendency on the part of the Church's apologists to ignore these uncomfortable pages of history altogether. Unquote. As with so many things, we quote, do not doubt that extremes have existed on both sides. We realize also that with reports of immoral conduct, there is the possibility of exaggeration. Unquote. But even allowing for this, the problems that have accompanied the doctrine of forbidding to marry are too obvious to be ignored. The Catholic Encyclopedia, though seeking to explain and justify celibacy, admits there have been many abuses. The Catholic Encyclopedia. Please, dear listener, understand this. This is at least, I think, I didn't tell them, but the 30th or 40th time in this book that the Catholic Encyclopedia is cited speaking the things that you otherwise do not hear from the clergymen, that you otherwise do not hear from Roman Catholics, but Look up their own writings. Look up their own encyclopedias. They admit all these things. We just don't read it and therefore put it away as conspiracy theory. There is no conspiracy theory whenever you go to the ground of every so-called theory and you merge the facts with your theory and you will see that every theory comes into fruition as a conspiracy fact. Anyway, what does the Catholic Encyclopedia say here? Quote, We have no wish to deny or to palliate the very low level of morality to which a different, at different periods of the world's history and in different countries calling themselves Christian, the Catholic priesthood has occasionally sunk. Corruption was widespread. How could it be otherwise when there were introduced, I intruded into bishoprics on every side men of brutal nature and unbridled passions who gave the very worst example to the clergy over whom they ruled? A large number of the clergy, not only priests, but bishops, openly took wives and begat children to whom they transmitted the benefices. Unquote. Now, just a little comment here. Some today would like to say the sexual abuse and immorality by priests was just made up by those opposed to the Roman Catholic Church. But the scandal, when you remember in 2010, about many sexual abuse cases in the Roman Catholic Church in different countries and the cover-ups done by the previous decades, attests to the sexual sins among some. But nevertheless, it has been there in Roman Catholic Church and in previous ages much, much worse. And I tell you right now, it is all because of idolatry. Idolatry takes you away from God. Idolatry makes you what they call today homosexual, makes you a sodomite, makes you a fornicator. Idolatry lets loose of all your natural borders. And you're going rampant. And these priests 
have been abusing children all their life, have been abusing the trust these children put in them because they were figures to be trusted. And they abused it. In history, today, and sorry to say, also tomorrow. There's no rule in the Bible that requires a minister to be unmarried. The apostles were married, and we read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. Quote, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? Unquote. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia again says, Quote, we do not find in the New Testament any indication of celibacy being made compulsory either upon the apostles or those whom they ordained. Unquote. Now, search this sentence in the Catholic Encyclopedia online. I did. And you will find this exact article and these exact words. You know, it was written in this book with this sentence, but I never swallow anything that is said in books or documents without confirming resources here and there. I do my own research in addition to just reading. And I will provide the link for the one who is too lazy to Google it themselves and find it out by themselves of the site of newadvent.org of the Catholic Encyclopedia where you can find this exact expression, quote, we do not find the New Testament in the New Testament any indication of celibacy being made compulsory either upon the apostles or those whom they ordained, unquote. I'll provide the links in the description box of the video and you can look it up for yourselves. The doctrine of forbidding to marry developed only gradually within the Roman Catholic Church. When the celibacy doctrine first began to be taught, many of the priests were married men. There was some question, though, if a priest whose wife died should marry again. A rule established at the Council of Neo Caesarea in 315, quote, absolutely forbids a priest to contract a new marriage under the pain of deposition, unquote. Later, at a Roman council held by Antichrist Siricius, in 386, an edict was passed forbidding priests and deacons to have conjugal intercourse with their wives, and the Pope took steps to have the decree enforced in Spain and other parts of Christendom. Well, Spain was never a place of Christendom. It was always a place of Roman Catholicism, and we all know that Roman Catholicism and Christianity are absolutely two things who are opposed to each other. And they don't mix and don't mingle. Stay true to Scripture. The Bible terms forbidding to marry a doctrine of devils. In these statements from the Catholic Encyclopedia, the careful reader will notice the words forbid and forbidding. The word forbidding is the same word as the Bible uses when warning about forbidding to marry, but in exactly the opposite sense. Meaning, the Catholic Encyclopedia teaches, or the Roman Catholic Church, better said, teaches exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible terms forbidding to marry, quote, is a doctrine of devils. So when the Roman Catholic Church forbids you to marry as a priest, it is a doctrine of devil. And you don't have to believe Jocla 66, Hour of the Truth, believe the Bible. There you can read it and research it for yourself. Taking all of these things into consideration, we can see how Paul's prediction was fulfilled. Paul's prediction, we read in 1 Timothy, the first three chapters. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. That's the one, 1 through 3, not the 
three chapters, the first three verses of chapter four. Quote, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the face, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created, to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Unquote. Did the departure from the original faith come? Yes. Did people give heed to SU and sun worshipping pagan doctrines, the doctrines of devils? Yes. Were priests forbidden to marry? Yes. And because of this forced celibacy, many of these priests ended up having their consciences seared with a hot iron and spoke lies and hypocrisy because of the immorality into which they fell. History has shown the fulfillment of each part of this prophecy. The doctrine of forbidding priests to marry met with, a, with other difficulties over the centuries because of the confessional. It is plain to see that the practice of girls and women confessing their moral weaknesses and desires to unmarried priests could easily result in many abuses. A former priest, Charles Chinnicky, who lived at the time of Abraham Lincoln and was personally acquainted with him, gives a full account of such corruption in connection with the professional, along with actual cases in his book The Priest, the Woman and the Confessional. Quote, we are not suggesting that all priests should be judged by the mistakes, of, uh, by the mistakes or sins of some. We do not doubt that many priests have been very dedicated to the vows they have taken. Nevertheless, the countless attacks, to use the wording of the Catholic Encyclopedia, that have been made against the confessional were not, in many cases, without basis. Now, that was not a quote. <coughs> but um, Chenicki writes about this in his book, The Priest, the Woman and the Confessional. Next to 50 Years in the Church of Rome, a book I highly recommend for everybody to read. That the doctrine of confession has caused difficulties for the Romish Church, in one way or another, seems implied by the wording of the Catholic Encyclopedia. After mentioning the countless attacks, it says, quote, If at the Reformation or since the Church could have surrendered a doctrine or abandoned a practice for the sake of peace and, so, and to soften a hard-saying confession, would have been the first to disappear. Unquote. In a carefully worded article, the Catholic Encyclopedia explains that the power to forgive sins belongs to God alone. Nevertheless, the, he exercises this power through the priests. Yeah. A passage in John, chapter 20, verses 22 and 23, is interpreted to mean a priest can forgive or refuse to forgive sins. Now, let's read what John says. Quote, And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, and ye are remitted unto them, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Unquote. John 20, verses 22 and 23. In order for him to make this decision, since specifically and in detail, according to the Council of Trent, must be confessed to him. Quote, How can a wise and prudent judgment be rendered if the priest be in ignorance of the cause on which judgment is pronounced? And how can he obtain the requisite knowledge unless it come from the spontaneous acknowledgement of the sinner? Unquote. Having given priests the authority to forgive sins, it is inconsistent to believe, says the article, that Christ, quote, had intended to provide some other means of forgiveness, such as confessing to God alone. Unquote. Confessions to a priest for those who after baptism commit sins 
is necessary unto salvation. Unquote. There is a type of confessions that the Bible teaches, but it is not confession to an unmarried priest. The Bible says, confess your faults one to another. Why? Because we are all priests, we are all saints, we are all brethren, nobody stands above us. The hierarchy of the churches of this world is not the hierarchy of the Church of God. The Church of God knows one Master, even Jesus Christ, and all we are his brethren. The Bible says, confess your faults to one another. We can read this in James chapter 5, verse 16. Quote, confess your faults on one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Unquote. If this verse could be used to support the Catholic idea of confession, then not only should people confess to priests, Priests should confess to the people. That's how it is done in the Church of Christ. Because there are no priests, we are all brethren. And we confess the sins to one another. But did you ever hear a Roman Catholic priest confess his sins to someone in the confession chair? I don't think so. But the author is absolutely correct when he says if this verse could be used to support the Catholic idea of confession, the Roman Catholic idea of confession, then not only should people confess to priests, but priests should confess to the people. When Simon of Samaria sinned after having been baptized, Peter did not tell him to confess to him. He did not tell him to say the Hail Mary for a given number of times a day. Peter told him to pray to God for forgiveness. We read this in Acts chapter 8, verse 22. Quote, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps he thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Unquote. When Peter sinned, he confessed to God and was forgiven. When Judas sinned, he confessed to a group of priests and committed suicide. As we read in Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5. Quote, then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Unquote. The idea of confessing to a priest came not from the Bible. It came from Babylon. Secret confession was required before complete initiation was granted into the Babylonian mysteries. Once such confession was made, the victim was bound hand and foot to the priesthood. Yeah, because when they know all your trespasses, they can... How do you say that in English? Blackmail you. That's the word I was looking for. Sometimes, I'm sorry, <laughs> I got the words in Dutch and in German in my head and I just can't come to the English translation. They can blackmail you. When you confess all your sins to the priest, what can he do? Blackmail you. They could do that in old Babylon and they can still do that today. And they are doing it. The idea of confessing to a priest came not from the Bible but from Babylon. Secret confession was required. Once such confession was made, the victim was bound, hand and foot, to the priesthood. Because they can blackmail you with everything that you told them in so-called confidence. There can be no doubt that confessions will be made in Babylon, for it is from such recorded confessions and 
only from these that historians have been able to formulate conclusions about the Babylonian concepts of right and wrong. The concept of confession was not limited to Babylon, however. Salverte wrote in his practice among the Greeks, quote, All the Greeks from Delphi to Thermopylae were initiated in the mysteries of the temple of Delphi. Their silence in regard to everything they were commanded to keep secret was secured by the general confession exacted of the aspirants after initiation. Unquote. Certain types of confession were also known in the regions of Medo-Persia, Egypt and Rome before the dawn of Christianity. Black is the distinctive color of the clergy garments worn by the priests of the Roman Catholic Church and even some Protestant denominations also follow this custom. But why black? Can any of us picture Jesus and his apostles wearing black garments? Black has for centuries been linked with death. Hearses traditionally have been black. Black is worn by mourners at funerals, etc. If any suggest that black should be worn in honor of the death of Christ, we would only point out that Christ is no longer dead. Christ is the living God and he lives. On the other hand, the Bible mentions certain priests of Baal that dressed in black. God's message through Zephaniah was this, quote, I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the Chemerims with the priests, as we can read in Zephaniah 1 verse 4. The Chemerims were priests who wore black garments. This same title is translated idolatrous priests in another passage about Baal worship. And we can read for that in confirmation in the second book of Kings, chapter 23, verse 5. Quote, and he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all of the hosts of heaven. Unquote. Adam Clark says, quote, probably they were an order made by the idolatrous kings of Judah and called Kemarim from Kamar, which signifies to be made dark or black, because their business was constantly to attend sacrificial fires and probably they wore black garments. Hence, the Jews in derision called Christian ministers Kemarim because of their black clothes and garments. Why we should imitate in our sacerdotal dress those priests of Baal is strange to think and hard to tell. Unquote. Black is the color of death. And when a priest wears black, he is giving a sermon of a dead God, Satan. Another practice of the Catholic Church, which was also known in ancient times and among non-Christian people, is the tonsure. The Catholic Encyclopedia says the tonsure is, quote, a sacred rite instituted by the Church by which a Christian is received into the clerical order by sharing, uh, shearing, sorry, shearing of his hair. Historically, the tonsure was not in use in the primitive Church. Even later, St. Jerome, between 340 and 450 AD, disapproved of clerics shaving their heads. You know, the tonsure, I will put a picture in that in the, picture, uh, in, in the video right here. It says here in the Catholic Encyclopedia itself, listen. Historically, the tonsure was not in use in the primitive church. Now, what is the primitive church the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia relates to here? The primitive church is the true church. But yeah, call it primitive and nobody wants to be associated with being primitive, right? 
The primitive church is the true church, the church that came out of the gospel teaching of Jesus Christ, out of the book of Acts, out of the Bible. That is the primitive church. The Roman Catholic Church is so-called better the advanced church. Well, I stay to the primitive church. I stay to ground principles. I stay to the word of God. Even St. Jerome disapproved of clerics shaving their heads. Is it no sharing or shearing? I don't know. Sharing like you do lambs, like. <sighs> but by the 6th century the tonja was quite common. The Council of Toledo made it a strict rule that all clerics must receive the tonja, but today the custom is no longer practiced in many countries. It is known and acknowledged that this custom was not in use in the primitive church. As I've just said, what does that mean? But it was known among S.U.N. sun-worshipping pagan nations. Buddha shaved his head in obedience to a supposed divine command. The priests of Osiris in Egypt were distinguished by the shaving of their heads. The priests of Bacchus received the tonsure. In the Roman Catholic Church the form of tonsure used in Britain was called Celtic, with only a portion of hair being shaved from the front of the head. In Eastern form the whole was shaved. But the Roman form, called the tonsure of St. Peter, the round tonsure was used, leaving only hair around the edges with upper portion of the head bald. The Celtic tonsure of priests in Britain was ridiculed as being the tonsure of Simon Magus. But why did Rome insist on the round tonsure? Well, aren't we reading about Babylonian S.U.N. sun worship right here? What do you think why Rome always insists on round things? Here the round tonja? We may not have the full answer, but we do know that such was quote an old practice of the priests of Mithra, when their tonjas imitated the solar disk. As the sun god was the great lamented god and had his hair cut in a circular form and the priests who lamented him had their hair cut in a similar manner. So in different countries those who lamented the dead and cut off their hair in honor of them cut it in a circular form." Unquote. That such was a very ancient custom known even at the times of Moses, may be seen right within the Bible. Such was forbidden for priests. Quote, they shall not make baldness upon their head, as we read in Leviticus 21, verse 5. And that such baldness was the rounded tonsure seems implied from Leviticus 19, verse 27. Quote, Ye shall not round the corners of your head. The tonsure is admitted on all sides, was not a practice of Christ the Apostles or the early church or the primitive church as they call it today. It was, on the other hand, a rite among non-Christian religions from ancient times. The reader may judge for himself the source of this custom within the Roman Catholic Church. So this was chapter 16 then from Babylon Mystery Religion and I will not continue in chapter 17 because that is long enough to make an own video from but I've come to 39 minutes. So I'll stop it here and for once, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I do that, don't do a whole hour of the reading. But I hope you found it interesting and revealing and that you do your own research on the things that I've told you here. An unmarried priesthood is absolutely unbiblical. Yeah? It is the Roman Catholic Church that teaches that because of their heritage they have from Babylon. The author took a lot of what he wrote in here from Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. 
And that is a monumental interesting work that I'm reading for the moment in German to my German brethren uh, under the title von Babylon nach Rom. And uh, he did his research, Alexander Hislop, and also did Ralph Woodrow. Modern Rome is old Babylon. It is mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations. There is no question, even though we haven't read the whole book yet, that the origins, that the roots of Roman Catholicism are in Babylon, as is with every other religion, which is a man-made belief system. Following the Bible, the word of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is not religion. That is adhering to the Creator. That has nothing to do with religion. Religion is man-made and all religion comes from Babylon. You want to go deeper into that? Read Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. I can absolutely advise you to do that. It's a fantastic and interesting book to read. But this book also gives us a lot of the roots of the Roman Catholic Church and we can see that their roots all lead to Babylon. So when everybody says all roads lead to Rome, true. And all Roman roads lead to Babylon. That is where all the sickness of the world, of this world derives from. Babylon. And that will be destroyed with the coming of Messiah. I can't wait for him to come back. In the meantime, <coughs> I will continue reading this book and next time uh, read to you chapter 17, which is called The Mass. And we go into the Mass and the Eucharist and all that stuff. It's very interesting, so stay tuned to another for another reading from Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth of Babylon Mystery Religion. See you next time. Until then, God bless you all and bye-bye.